Um, I am going to be presenting a little bit of my research in the British archives today. Um, I wrote out my paper, so I hope you don't mind if I follow some stuffy conventions of the history discipline and read this out loud for you. In the village of Armant, in the upper Egyptian province of Inna, the village sheikh and the sheikh lil Khufara, or chief of police, were shot at and beaten to death by a group of villagers. In the melee, some of the Khufara fired on the crowd, killing three villagers and wounding three others. In the delta town of Farsakur, 26 men staged a sit-in in the Marquez prison and refused to leave for two days. A large crowd of local villagers gathered outside and cheered on the protesters to show their support for their cause. When the police tried to force their way into the prison, the assembled crowd began throwing stones at the police and tried to release the men who had staged the sit-in from the clutches of the police by force. The police responded by firing live ammunition at the crowd, and four villagers were wounded, including three women and one man. When the mullahs of police in the Biala outpost was preparing to leave for the Marquez Center in Talcha, a crowd of about 200 villagers assembled to block his path. Some of the crowd struck the mullahs and other policemen stationed at the outpost, and 31 villagers were arrested in the effort to suppress the demonstration by force. All three of these acts that I've just mentioned happened within close succession of one another, but when did they take place? We would normally associate such a wave of violence sweeping through the Egyptian countryside and aimed at the infrastructures and personnel of the British colonial state with the March 1919 revolution that Dr. Abu al Ghar just gave you the history of. But actually, these three events are all part of a wave of violence that took place between May and August of 1918 almost a year before the celebrated events of the 1919 revolution. This is what I am referring to in my presentation today as the 1918 Peasant Rebellion. The rebellion was not given much attention at all in the contemporary Egyptian press sources from that fateful summer, but this is hardly surprising given that the press was under heavy censorship during the period of martial law that came with the First World War. But if we go to the British National Archives in London, we can find reports of at least 35 distinct yet connected and very violent repertoires of contentious politics emerging across the Egyptian countryside in the summer of 1918. At the British Archives, a large file titled Raising of Personnel for an Egyptian Labor Corps to Undertake Loading and Unloading in French Military Ports contains a series of correspondence between the British Foreign Office and British colonial officials attached to the Egyptian Ministry of Interior, marked with the series number 2689. This correspondence includes hundreds of pages of documents detailing how the British colonial state recruited Egyptian Falahin to carry out military labor for the British Army during World War I. It spans three separate files, FO141-797, FO141-667, which is shown here, and FO141-798. This correspondence includes reports of the 1918 Peasant Rebellion, such as the one shown here from the Baliana Marquez, which took place on June 4, 1918. The Peasant Rebellion arose in protest to the forced volunteering of hundreds of thousands of young men from the countryside of Egypt to serve as military laborers in the First World War. And of course, even though the British used the euphemism of volunteering to describe this process of young men going to work for the British in the war, the wave of violence that I'm discussing today which erupted in response to this labor recruitment, uh, shows that ELC recruitment, or recruitment for the Egyptian Labor Corps, was much more akin to forced conscription, or even slavery. Uh, the Egyptian uh, analog would be a sohra, the corvée 
which was a remnant of the Ottoman period in Egypt. So during World War I, Egyptians served as laborers in a variety of contexts. This is a picture here of a group of Egyptians working as stevedores on the docks of France and Flanders. And you can see in the foreground here uh, this British officer who was commanding the Egyptian laborers. Egyptian laborers also worked during the First World War as camel drivers, supplying troops in the Sinai Desert and in the Western Desert fight against the Sunusia. Of course, the Sinai Desert going into Palestine and the Western Desert with the border on Libya, these areas had no roads or railroads when the war began. And so the immediate solution that the British came up with was to use camels to supply their troops. But where did they get these camels? Many of them were actually requisitioned for below market values from Egyptians, from rural Egyptian farmers in the countryside. And who drove these camels? It was, again, Egyptian laborers who had the expertise and experience who were recruited to drive these camels and supply British troops during World War I. Egyptian laborers also built the water pipeline and railways that allowed British troops to advance through Palestine and into the heart of Ottoman Syria. And this picture here shows Egyptian laborers. Looks like a pretty hot day. They are working on laying down the water pipeline that allowed for these soldiers to have fresh water to drink as they were advancing through the desert. And of course, uh, these soldiers also needed a railway to supply them with their weapons and with their supplies. And so Egyptians, again, were tasked with laying these railroads across the Sinai Desert. And I have a picture here from the Australian War Memorial of Egyptians doing just this kind of work. So it is this massive recruitment of Egyptian laborers. Almost half a million Egyptians served in World War I. Uh, and this recruitment inspired the Peasant Rebellion of 1918. So today, I want to put forth the thesis that the Peasant Rebellion of 1918 provides evidence that at least some of the rural violence associated with the later March 1919 revolution cannot be attributed to sympathy or identification with the nationalist cause. The Peasant Rebellion was fueled by grievance over British recruitment of Egyptian laborers during the First World War not by anger over the arrest and exile of Sa'ad Zaglul and the Waft. The Peasant Rebellion and its earlier start date undermines the nationalist myth that the revolution was a moment of the manifestation of the collective will of the Egyptian people in support of Sa'ad Zaglul. Today, I will describe the initial phase of this Peasant Rebellion between May and August of 1918, almost a full year before the beginning of the weft. I will show how this rebellion continued throughout the fall of 1918 and into the winter of 1919. And then finally, I will link it to the events that took place in the Egyptian countryside almost exactly 100 years ago today during the 1919 revolution. So first, Let's take a look at the events of the first phase of the Peasant Rebellion, which began well before Sa'ad Zaglul and his colleagues had even begun thinking about the idea of the Waft in May of 1918. The 35 incident reports preserved in the British National Archives in FO 141797 break down into three main categories. The most common and perhaps most instinctive method of violent resistance to military labor recruitment was for individuals to physically resist the officials of the British colonial state whenever they attempted to grab them off the street or from their homes. Oftentimes, individuals who were being recruited by the British to serve in World War I would just grab whatever kind of weapons they could find nearby, including sticks, stones, knives, and rifles. This kind of individual resistance or violence was reported in 18 out of 35 of the incident reports I found, uh, making up approximately 51% of the reports. The second type of violent resistance to recruitment took place within family units and extended family units. And because families in the Egyptian countryside often lived nearby each other in large compounds, 
When one family member was being taken against their will to serve in World War I, other family members could get involved to stop that from happening. And so I counted 11 family-based incidents that took place between May and August of 1918. And these confrontations often escalated to the use of force. These family-based incidents are particularly interesting because they provided a forum for the women of the countryside to get involved in resistance against British recruitment. And the reports that I found detail the use of force against women by police in at least two cases, one of which I opened my lecture with. And finally, the third type of violent resistance to military labor recruitment was what I'm referring to here as mass resistance. When large crowds of hundreds of people, sometimes including the entire population of a given village, rose up to intervene in efforts to recruit laborers. And I counted seven examples of mass resistance to military labor recruitment preserved in the British archives between May and August of 1918. All told, analyses of these reports show that battles between villagers and recruiting officials in the bloody summer of May 1918 led to the deaths of one Omda, one Sheikh al-Balad, and three Khufara. A further 35 Khufara were wounded by villagers, and as for the villagers themselves who put their bodies and lives on the line to resist labor recruitment, 18 of them were killed, 22 were wounded, and 85 were arrested. So despite this wave of violence, the recruitment of Egyptian workers and peasants, farmers, to undertake military labor for the British Army continued throughout the fall of 1918, and even after World War I had officially ended on November 1st. This is an example of that. On November 9, 1918, a week after the signing of the armistice with Egyptians, Egyptian Prime Minister Hussein Rushdi Pasha wrote to Reginald Wingate, then serving as the British High Commissioner in Egypt, complaining of the disturbances caused by the continued conscription of military laborers. And as you can see here, this is General Edmund Allenby's reply to Rushdi on November 17th where he wrote to Wingate in order to justify the continued recruitment of Egyptians after the end of the war. You can see here, he writes that there are many services which the cessation of hostilities does not affect as regards reduction in labor requirements. Allenby therefore called for a continuance or even an increase of military labor recruitment even after the end of the First World War. And as recruitment continued, so too did violent resistance. With reports of violent incidents from September 1918, December 1918, and January 1919 preserved in the British archives. Thus, it seems that the Peasant Rebellion continued along with labor recruitment throughout the fall of 1918 and into the winter of 1919. So, now that we have covered the first wave of the 1918 Peasant Rebellion and its continuation into early 1919, let's take a look at how this Peasant Rebellion and the recruitment of laborers that sparked to it was linked to the 1919 Revolution, this event that we've all come here to discuss. Today, I want to argue that in at least two ways, one specific and one general, Reaction to the military labor recruitment of the Falahin, rather than to the arrest and exile of Sa'ad Zaglul and the Weft, were the animating impulses behind the rural unrest that swept through the Egyptian countryside in March of 1919. So two ways that Egyptian labor recruitment inspired 1919 instead of sympathy with the nationalist revolution. Uh, one specific, and one general. So first, let's talk about that specific way. And that has to do with the province of Asyut. So as you can see here, Asyut is a province in the northern part of Upper Egypt. And when I analyzed the reports, the 35 reports of the first wave of the Peasant Rebellion in summer of 1918, 
I was shocked to find that 12 of these 35 incidents took place just within this one province, the province of Asyut. That's over a third of all the events taking place in just Asyut, and because there were only 14 provinces in Egypt at this time, this number of incidents taking place in Asyut is 4.8 times larger than we would expect it to be in a completely even distribution of violence. I also mapped out the spatial distribution of these events, as you can see here, that took place in the summer of 1918. And even though this is a small end data set that we're working with here, it seems that we can tentatively say that people in Asyut were uniquely angry about labor recruitment in the summer of 1918. Moreover, this trend apparently continued after the summer, as a memo from the British advisor to the Ministry of Interior in January of 1919 complained about, quote, scores of cases in two provinces, Asyut and Girga, where Rafirs have suffered injuries bringing recruits in, end quote. The memo also notes, quote, in other Mudiriyat, there seems little or no trouble in this connection, end quote. So that's a memo from the British in January 1919 that's saying Asyut is uniquely angry about Egyptian labor recruitment. In March of 1919, Asyut was again the scene of massive unrest during the revolution. I made another map here plotting out the deaths of Egyptians that took place in March and April of 1919 based on the lists of martyrs made up by Abdul Rahman Rafai. As this map shows, Asyut was one of three provinces that was hit hardest by the unrest. Moreover, unrest in Asyut was uniquely aimed at British officers who had either served in the Egyptian labor corps, commanding Egyptians, or officers who were responsible for recruiting the Fellahin. The most infamous incident took place in Deirut, a town in Asyut located along the railway, when on the night of March 17, 1919, a group of British officers tried traveling from Luxor to Cairo by rail, and a group of rioters stopped their train at the Deirut station, stormed on board, and killed seven British officers. And four of these seven British officers were actually young British men who had been serving as commanders of the Egyptian Labor Corps, overseeing Egyptians laboring in France and elsewhere. Six days late, later, rioters in a town in the province of Asyut murdered another Egyptian Labor Corps officer. This man was Lieutenant Colonel William Hazel, and he was the British recruiting inspector with responsibility for Upper Egypt. And as such, he would have been the British face of military labor recruitment for the Fellahin in the region. All of this suggests that in the province of Asyut, repertoires of contentious politics that included the use of violent force had been forged during the 1918 Peasant Rebellion, which then set the stage for the rural unrest that took place in March 1919. Rather than simply being derivative of the centralized nationalist movement in Cairo, we can therefore see rural unrest in Asyut as part of a separate, more localized movement that had grown up in response to military labor recruitment during World War I. So this is number one, the specific way that I'm arguing today that military labor recruitment motivated rural violence during the 1919 revolution over and above and more so than the nationalist movement led by Saad Zaglul. But there is also a more general sense in which labor recruitment set the stage for the revolution. And this was by giving Egyptians across the country a shared set of grievances against the British colonial state. Essentially, the experiences of World War I homogenized the experiences of all Egyptians and created within that crucible the identity of Egyptians, rather than Egyptians confronting World War I as an already existing identity, it was an identity that was forged out of this unique conjunction of World War I. So I'm gonna look at popular culture, as I know Mr. Gorgisian will do later, because during World War I, the press in Egypt was under heavy censorship, under martial law, Kanun Utwari, and the grievances under British colonial state could not be protested in public because of the laws. 
So the main public critique, the main forum rather, for making public critiques of the British colonial state became, in a sense, music and popular culture. And uh, I'm putting up here one song that I found translated in the British National Archives. It's a song that was supposedly popular among demonstrators during the 1919 revolution in both rural and urban areas. Uh, it's a song that only exists in English translation. I don't know if we have actually an Arabic version of this song, but there were other popular Arabic songs that were discussed in the laborers as Mr. Gregersian will talk about today. But as you can see, this translation of the song goes as follows. Excuse us, O Wingate, our country has been conquered. You have taken away our barley, our camels and donkeys, and much corn, so leave us alone. Our laborers were sent out, as well as our soldiers. They left their land and went to the battlefields. They served in the trenches, even the mountains of Lebanon. They lay blame on us, behold us, and the calamities they have caused us. Had it not been for our laborers, they with their rifles could have done nothing in the midst of sandy deserts. And of course, the song probably sounds a lot better in Egyptian Arabic. But we can see from the translation that it lists a series of grievances against the British based on the wartime mobilization of natural resources, animals, and laboring bodies. The lyrics take pride in the contributions of Egyptian laborers to the Allied victory in the war, but they also criticize the British for their recruitment pra practices. So by listening to popular music like this song and many others, including Said Darwish's songs, Selma, Ya Salama, and Ya Aziza Aini, British officials came to understand that mass unrest during the revolution could not be simply reduced to sympathy with the nationalist movement and Saad Zaglul, but it was informed by wartime grievances. So in conclusion, we have seen today that a massive wave of peasant unrest began in Egypt in May of 1918 months before the Waft was even an idea in the head of Sa'ad Zaglul, and almost a year before the beginning of the revolution. This unrest was motivated by reaction to the recruitment of Egyptian fellahin to serve as military laborers in the war, rather than sympathy with the nationalist movement. The unrest continued throughout the fall and winter and carried into the 1919 revolution itself. I have argued that this provides evidence that the events of 1919, especially in the province of Asyut, cannot be reduced to a nationalist revolution. Instead, we should situate the violence that swept through Egypt in 1919, on the one hand, in the global context of the First World War, and on the other hand, in various specific local contexts with the rural demonstrations in particular showing a lack of coordination with the WAFT. Thank you so much, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have.